confidence. Can you show me confidence? The letter C is if it's coming from someplace else. Confidence. It's kind of separated and then it comes together and it forms in this sign language an S. So there's these things that are C's and S's in the alphabet. Confidence. I'm fascinated by the topic of confidence. And maybe it's because I lack it. I struggle with it. And sometimes I look at myself and I think about, my gosh, what is my problem here? You know, I'm of a certain age. I've done certain things a lot of times. And yet, I feel like, oh gosh, do I have got this? Or should I do this? Or is this right? I lack confidence. And I look at other people and I think, oh my gosh, I love how confident they are and I admire their confidence. Sometimes when I talk with or listen to some of you or other people, I'll hear something where I think, oh my goodness, you're struggling with confidence, kind of like I am, and I can't believe it. When I see you, I think, you are competent. You are good. You are doing such great things. How can you lack confidence? So confidence, I think it's a very interesting topic. It's a big topic in psychology. So I love reading articles and taking classes and, you know, work through counseling to understand myself and the world better. And in the realm of confidence in psychology, I would relate it to self-respect, self-esteem, and a new one that I learned a few years back is self-efficacy, self-efficacy. It's a form of self-belief. Do you believe in yourself? So that's a big one these days. So uh, pastors do this thing called Call to Health, and we go through um, this thing called LeaderWise. They're at Synod School every year. And sometimes, you know, their training or their material that they talk about is self-efficacy. And a few years ago, you know, to take a class, I did this, like, screening thing. And um, it turned up, oh, Sarah, you are, you lack a sense of self-efficacy. And it was helpful to name that. It's helpful to name that. This, I also think, is related to something else I've seen more articles about or people refer to. And while um, I don't know that this term has really helped me, but I think it's helpful for a lot of other people, it's called imposter syndrome. Like, people don't believe that they feel like an imposter in their own <coughs> lives. So it's a very detrimental thing. And I know that when I believe in myself, I function so much better. And when I don't believe in myself, ugh, I don't function as well. It's just a reality. But that third step of, well, Sarah, you should just believe in yourself, you know, and then it'll be over, that uh, step has never, the, the pressure, the idea that I have to work at it, has not been so much a key to unlocking a sense of confidence and well-being. So my heart always alerts when I read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. Paul writes, such is our confidence, confidence. The apostle Paul writes about confidence. That's at least how the word is translated in our NRSV translation, confidence. So I alert to that word as if, 
one, you know, one who has more to learn about confidence. So this week, I sat with the Apostle Paul, who has no lack of confidence. Is that man confident or what? You know, we've you've been reading him in Acts and all, all his letters, he comes across as pretty darn confident. But it's interesting what he says about confidence, and I think it gives us a psychological foothold. He says that we have confidence, but the confidence he talks about comes through Christ toward God. Such is our confidence, through Christ toward God. So confidence isn't something I need to muster so that I feel better and can operate better. No, confidence is a gift that comes to us through Christ. Well, that's pretty cool. I kind of like that. It feels like this gift of grace. And if it's a gift, it's something I'm called to steward, take care of. I've been given a gift of confidence. Such is the gift, such is the confidence we have, not just me, everybody. We have confidence through Christ. And this confidence we have through Christ is toward God. There goes Paul again with his prepositions, through, toward, something to look for. When you read Paul, I know this has come up in our readings of the letter to the Romans, for example, through Christ, toward God. So through Christ, we have confidence, so it's this gift. But it's not just, oh, I've got this gift, so now I feel better about myself. It's confidence through Christ, and toward God. Christ gives us confidence in God, not ourselves. Now this sounds like, oh, are we erasing human beings and individuals? Hold on, we're not there yet. What's happening is, I think, a stronger grounding for true confidence and healthy psychology. Through Christ, we are given confidence toward God. How does Christ give us confidence toward God? Well, Jesus is our best example of who God is. God, seen in Jesus, is humble, helpful, healing, talks to everybody, exemplifies love, servant, and he was also maligned by others. People spoke horribly of him. And, um, you know, in the end of his life, pretty much everybody abandoned him. And he was killed brutally, unjustly, on a cross. Yet through Christ, we see the power of God. His death on the cross wasn't the final part of the story. Jesus gives us confidence in a God who has power over evil and can change anything. Such is our confidence in God. We see it in Jesus. The worst possible thing happened to him, a person of God, a good person, wrongfully accused, brutally killed. And through him, we see God's power and that he, God, is not a God of vengeance, trying to punish those who harmed Jesus. Jesus forgives and says, come on, use this to orient yourselves to the power of God for goodness, no matter what is going on. This is our confidence through Christ toward God, we have confidence in a God of power, no matter what is going on. That is incredible. Do we take hold? Do we latch hold of that confidence? Do we 
trust it. It's a pretty amazing uh, piece of confidence. The text goes on about confidence. Jesus alerts us to having confidence in a God of love and power and light. And this God gives us competence, which is similar to confidence. God gives us another gift of competence. So our competence, our sense of being qualified, our sense of worth comes through God, who is all too generous to love us and say, we are worthy, we have worth. That is where our confidence comes from. So we're, we get confidence in God through Christ, and then God gives us confidence and competence in who we are. And that's our full humanity, whoever we are. Wow. With the confidence God gives us, Paul continues, it's not so that we can climb a ladder, score on Wall Street, be popular or handsome or successful. The confidence God gives us is so that we are competent, we are confident in the work of new covenant. God makes us confident in being ministers of of a new covenant. We are competent in a totally new way of life. That's everyone's vocation, new covenant. This new covenant is this life of the spirit. I wonder if part of this work that God gives us confidence in is helping others learn the footholds of confidence. Because so many are forlorn or questioning their worth or hearing stuff that makes, that negates who they're made as ones in God's image. So to recap this confidence thing, confidence, it's not something we muster up. It's something that through Christ we have toward God. We have confidence in God that the universe is good, that the universe is loving and just and powerful and orients us to a new way. We have confidence in that. And that universe that we know as God gives us confidence and competence to practice life in a new way. And not that this is easy by any means, this practice of new life. I think that's why Paul talks about it and he gives people kind of a pep talk Because if you believe in this cosmic goodness, if you really are in that zone of glory, talk about that in just a bit, of understanding the total goodness of God, others might not see it, and others might not be practicing that new way. And a lot of society is geared toward making money, moving up a ladder, elbowing somebody else out. We all have our brokenness and distortions where our egos and our, um, you know, our defense mechanisms, whatever, kind of shrink or curtail how we operate in the world. It's very, very hard. But such is our confidence in God. Through Christ, we have the power to see through baloney or how people harm us or others. Such is our confidence. And then Paul goes on in chapter, in verse 12, we have such a hope that we act with boldness. We have such a hope that we can act with boldness. That's pretty amazing. In the middle of chapter 3, if you've read it, a lot of us got bogged down because Paul starts talking about glory. And when Paul talks about glory in the middle of that chapter, he's just using it as an example. Moses experienced God's glory when he received the Ten Commandments. So he's talking about, oh my gosh, he, he experienced the glory of God, how God was connected to humans 
and desired relationship and guidance. And Moses, because he, he faced God, he took on some of God's glory, so he glowed. So you might say for Halloween, he had to wear a mask. He had to wear a veil because he was just too shiny for people when he came back down the mountain. So that was a lot of glory. But Paul says the glory that we experience through Christ toward God is an even bigger glory. It's like all the masks, all the veils are off, and it's pure glory. That's the nature of the universe. We can have confidence that it is 100% glory, grace, love, peace, hope, 100%. Sometimes in life, though, we don't experience that, even if it's absolutely true. You know, I pray for each one of us that we um, learn confidence. Not so that we have a big ego or climb a ladder, that we have confidence in God and God's work in our lives. And through that work, we are a part of glory. The text ends with, we are transformed from one likeness to another. We are, tra we are changed, transformed into the likeness of God. We realize that we are children of God. So hopefully across the journey of life, we glow just a little bit more. And when we're not glowing, maybe we can help one another get back on that path of being confident. You know, as I was doing a little extra research uh, for today, I was reading some different psychological articles. So I talked earlier about self-efficacy. Self-belief gives you um, a foothold in your day. Another psychologist talks about group efficacy. Group efficacy. And I love that idea. And it's a group of people who have a shared belief and a group of people who have a shared belief can change the world. And I thought, that's church. That, to me, is church. We're not alone. It's not about individuals working quietly in a lonely way on self-efficacy. The church, we're part of this environment that sees the kingdom of God, a place where everybody's welcome and worthy, and we're all working together. As a group, we believe that. We believe that. And because of that belief, and Paul would say, through Christ, toward God, we are ministers together of this amazing covenant that gives us such a hope that we can act with boldness. Verse 12, we have such a hope. We can act with boldness. We can even break molds. Discovery's challenging theme this year. You know, society can really bring us down and we think, ugh, what can we do? We can have confidence together. Confidence together that together the Spirit uses us to break molds, to have strength and boldness and courage, and we become more and more in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And even though we struggle, still got the struggle bus there, through, we trust that through struggle we are transformed. So confidence is just another word for faith. To God be the glory. Amen.